Today's theatrical cross-dressers and their fans may be surprised to learn that a century ago, one of the most popular stars of American show business was a female impersonator, Julian Eltinge. At the height of his fame, Eltinge had his own magazine, his own line of skin products, his name on a theater in 42nd Street, and appeared as a star with the likes of Rudo Valentino and Mary Pickford in silent film. For a poetic evocation of this fabulous forerunner and other stars of vaudeville, look to the new book, American Vaudeville by Jeffrey Hilsebeck. Here's a taste. The door to Julian L. Tinge's dressing room is painted black. When knocked, it rattles in its frame. He stands in front of a mirror, whitening his face and neck with powder. He's taken off his clothes, a brown suit hovers against the wall, a pair of brown loafers snug below. His bathrobe hangs loosely off his waist, and he's dipping a sponge into a cigar box full of white powder and touching it to his skin. He works with the semi-consciousness of an expert. At each touch of the sponge, his body becomes softer, rounder. Curves emerge. By now, the first layer of powder has stiffened, and a second has been loosely applied. He rubs cold cream into his cheeks and forehead, over his nose with two smooth strokes, over his ears and behind them, under the little cap covering his hair, and then down to his neck, grabs a rag from the dressing table and wipes off some excess cream, and then puts more powder on his face with the sponge, and on top of that, a layer of rouge. He rubs blue-black grease paint around his eyes and works it into the rouge and powder, adding contrast to his face, blackens his eyebrows, reddens his lips. Like a painter, he dips a sharp little stick into a metal cup, which has been heated over a candle, and transfers beads of a black sticky mixture to his eyelashes, a little black bead on each trembling lash. Now he's screwing his face into knots, pulling it first to one side and then the other, working it like putty, angling his jaw up and down, and as he does that, drawing faint, nearly invisible lines, which together will help him transform into a widow, a bride, a king's daughter. From there, he turns to his hands. First, he shaves his fingers. Then he rubs cream and powder into the palms and the backs of the hands and down each finger, thinning them, stretching them out, sanding off the roughness around the knuckles. Forty-five minutes and the makeup is done, but nothing else yet. A transformation of head, neck, shoulders, hands and wrists, but not waist or hips, no costume, head of a woman, but still the trunk of a man, robe hung loosely around him. He is a professional and an expert, relishes the details of his craft, describes again and again the tremendous work, the study and practice that he has devoted to it. He works from the outside in, through careful study and close observation, a mimic, a mirror. He slips the corset over his head and tugs on its silk laces hard, harder, until the frame is satisfactorily condensed. The corset settled, an empire gown is floated over his winnowed frame. A woman's dress must have temperament. To be effective, gowns must have personality. A pair of high-heeled shoes is brought out from a closet and slipped softly onto its feet, and finally, a beautiful black wig, raven black, lustrous is settled on his head like a crown and fastened with pins.
Thank you.